Lady Justice Rafferty is an extremely talented advocate, uh, and I had the pleasure of working with her some years ago, for in fact, many years actually, and we ran many trials together, and I've seen her in action, and she's absolutely fantastic, and she has the most extraordinary career as well. She was the first chair of the Criminal Bar Association. She became Queen's Counsel, I think, 1990. Uh, and then she became a Deputy High Court Judge, and then a High Court Justice in 2000 at the QBD, and she was made Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire. Uh, two notable trials are Paul Burrell and Sean Jenkins, and I think a couple of years back we had one of the QCs in the Sean Jenkins trial. Uh, she was appointed to the Court of Appeal in 2011, and she's also chair, chairperson of the Judicial College, which is responsible for training some 36,000 uh, um, judicial office holders. Uh, Anne has, is in a great pain at the moment, as you probably see from her stick, and I'm very grateful for her taking the trouble to come today. Uh, so uh, she's, she's also very kindly said that uh, she, the, the text of her speech, she's going to email to Bon Solon as soon as she gets back to the, the court this morning. Uh, she may not have time for questions today and also because of her, her, the pain she's in, so she will be shooting off. Uh, so there will be no questions, I'm sorry to say, but the text of her speech will be there. So would you be kind enough to give a very warm welcome, please, to Lady Justice Anne Rafferty. It's a particular pleasure for me to be here for three reasons. First, I was one of the earliest members of any professional body dedicated to advancing the standing and standards of expert witnesses. A governor of the Expert Witness Institute in 1997, uh, when such a thing was quite a departure from the norm. So, I would like to think that my credibility with you is off to a good start, in that at least I'm not a Johnny-come-lately, uh, and I can prove that my heart is in it. Second, I am here at the invitation of Mark Solon, who instructed me whilst I was at the bar, to whom I remain grateful, and from whom I learned. Mark has known me since I was in my 20s, and as he pointedly reminded me, had no nonsense from me then, and won't be having any now. <laughs> Third, because expert evidence is central to the good order of how we run our professional lives. With the deepening knowledge afforded us by scholarship, across so many disciplines, coupled with the availability of technology, our chance of doing right to all men, a part of the judicial oath, is markedly improved if we can rely on you. I know that you are obliged to live in the real world. I know that post-Jackson it's not just timetables which are unforgiving, it's fees. I know perfectly well that you face daily tussles when your professionalism tells you that the permitted four hours should be ten. It's all very well to add that you can apply to the court for more allowance, and you should, but it's one more thing to do and it's one further erosion of your time, and it's only directed toward making the mechanics line up, not towards what you were trained to do, explain the engineering, or the physics of the hip joint, or why intoxication wasn't on the facts a recognised medical condition. I know each of you is on top of Jones and Caney. I suspect that all the above must, 
if only from time to time. Trigger, you're asking yourself if it's worth getting out of bed. Well, let me try to set out why you must. You really must. First, consider the beneficial changes in how we now organize our litigious lives. Um, some of you, I can tell, will never have encountered what the uh, more mature among us did. Adversarial preparation and presentation to the exclusion of cooperation, pre and mid trial. The majority of you will have known nothing other than pre-trial sharing of views, distillation of areas of agreement and of disagreement with reasons for the second, and an analysis of where the court must concentrate. One or two comments, if I may, about pre-trial meetings. Just as I realize the compendious strains on you, which we've already considered, I acknowledge, too, the importance of these convergences and divergences being as good a use of time and resource as is possible. Your time, the other chap's time, the resources of the funding system, the imperative of adhering to a court-imposed timetable. There is no need to have a face-to-face -face exchange every time. Don't be reticent about suggesting a telecon or Skype or FaceTime con or if there are multiple parties, a webinar. When arranging to uh, discuss this conference, Mark was driven to distraction by the exigencies of the judicial diary such that at one stage I offered to FaceTime myself to him. Uh, it's extraordinary what Mark Solon can put into one monosyllable. <laughs> so trust me, I'm entirely sympathetic to people holding you to attendance account. When you go to a pre-trial or mid-trial joint consultation, try to leave your hackles at home, or at least down. If up, they predispose to a degree of acerbity, best avoided in most cases. Far better to adopt the good advocate's approach. I want to give away as many points as I properly can. Prepare with that as your central theme. It has several advantages. It is a splendid focus tool. Making a primary task one of shedding is arguably more effective than a narrative, a chronology, or a distillation of the experience upon which you rely to found your conclusions. If you go early on in the process to what can depart the exercise, the balance finds expression more easily for the brevity earned. Another advantage is that you look informed, aware of your duty to the court and confident. It's worth reflecting on why the best advocates do it. They have reasons additional to your own, but in common is what I've just set out. It conveys messages, both overt and covert, that you're at the helm, in control, driving the exercise, any number of descriptors of that type. And you will be confident. You won't be acting. The other major effect will be that when you haven't jettisoned, your words resonate with more power. One of the best examples of the lawyer achieving this was the then David Calvert Smith QC, prosecuting a difficult murder with lots going on in the evidence. In the usual 
pre-trial talk to his opponent, whom he knew well, he was asked to take out a list of six things. He said six versions of, sure, why not? And omitted them all. All of them. His opponent, who'd expected negotiation followed by some failure, realized too late what he was about. When he opened and then ran the case, the only three things that mattered shouted at the jury from day one. They never got lost, they remained stark, and time and time again, they brought the jury back to the essentials, and they got the crown home. It took mastery of the case, and confidence, and an understanding of human nature. I was irritated at the time, and as you can hear, I haven't forgotten, I being the opponent, you'll be just as successful. You need to know your stuff, take your principled stand, and let the rest go. Unlike a jury trial, many, uh, I would guess the vast majority of the contested cases in which your help will be sought are judge alone. And you represent a party highly likely to be financially interested in the outcome. The difference is that you know the finder of fact and decider of the issue, if it's judge alone, is intelligent and trained. Some of us are. And there's only one of him or her, whereas all you know of 12 jurors is that you don't know anything about the 12 of them. The same rule applies. Shed all you can. The judge has a lot to do, and the easier you make it, the better served she or he will feel. And on the topic of the judge sitting alone, please don't hang back from saying that the court might want to reflect upon, insert the error, you can phrase it to suit what you make of the personality listening. Some will welcome straight from the shoulder and find deference unwelcome. Some will be the reverse and some will be on a scale between the two. But the point to remember is this. The first instance judge is vulnerable to an appeal. If you haven't put him or her right when you could have done, if the decision is later overturned, your reputation will not be burnished. The judge will much prefer that you keep him or her safe from later criticism by pulling no punches when you're there as an expert. Take care that your CV is completely accurate completely on all fronts. Any deficiency will come back to bite you. The other side solicitor will check it. Make sure the same check has been done on the experts for the other side. Your presentation is likely to affect the weight of the evidence in a way have you been trained in how to give evidence? Tatty notes passed over counsel's shoulder is not a good look. Insist on a consultation with counsel in good time so you can, you can, if necessary, make him face the knotty issues. It will also give the opportunity to discuss how having you adds value. And don't let yourself be put off by cross-examination. You know your territory. Your expertise goes before you. It's why you're instructed in the first place. And you know cross-examination is coming your way. It'll go the other expert's way too when the turn comes. 
it's an opportunity for you to do several productive things. One, see the next or next but one question coming. How many of these procedures have you done in the last five years? 200. Now, we need to recall that you'll have read the other expert's CV. You ought to be ready for the subtext. Council laying the ground to make the point that his expert has done 2,000. But if you're the niche expert and he's five years your junior, the full answer may be that he's done 2,000 because he sees volume. You've done 200 because you're at the top of the complexity tree. So only the most challenging come to you. Perhaps you'd like to tell the court how many at your level he's done. Underlying your fuller answer is that you can do all he does. You did it for years. But he can't do the limited number you do. Courts warm to the expert who is still practicing. In, in medicine, is she or he a clinician? Worth thinking through whether you are and the other expert isn't, or each of you is, or you are, but the other expert isn't. If the last, expect questions designed to put it in the... You aren't, but he is. If the last, expect questions designed to put that in the spotlight. You can't change your position, but preparation for the approach is never wasted. No matter whether you're in front of a jury or a judge alone, the decision maker or makers wants and want to understand your opinion and to understand in general. Your opinion should be tracked and fortified. What are your workings? How did you reach the conclusions? What is the learning? When you're setting out your expert opinion, what's needed are simple words. A way of expressing yourself which is not prolix and the ability to identify and to distill the main issues. Jurors do better if told the victim had a punctured lung, not a pneumothorax, and a bruised cheek, not a hematoma to the zygomatic area. The judge will find it easier to note the former. The car slid across the damp carriageway because the brakes had been applied about three car lengths too late for the conditions. The footings were doomed from the moment the wrong proportions of concrete were mixed. Identify the main issues. Does it matter that the concrete was laid with a slightly uneven surface? Well, if it does, say so. But if the crunch comes over whether it wasn't allowed to cure for the right length of time and therefore wasn't strong enough, say just that. All that said, beware of the could you just question. Quite often it comes well into cross-examination and after you've dealt with either challenges or invitations to expand or both, will come, could you just tell the court the answer to this simple point? Be very careful. It might be a simple point, which you can answer simply. It might, however, and it often is, a simple point which you cannot answer simply. Stand your ground and get subtlety 
into your answer. It is not simply answered by any expert. There'll be a follow-up. There always is. Next answer. The issues are stratified, interlinked, subtle, and I cannot do my duty by over-reducing them. There comes a time, all this said, when it's not you, but the judge, who should be expected to take control of how experts are being treated. Seeing when that comes is, for you, a question of experience. But it's an awareness you can work on developing from day one. Your duty is to the court. You're an expert, and your expertise permits you to advise whoever instructs you. There is one thing you are not, and should never be, and that's an advocate. There are likely to be instances when some genuflection to the interests of the party instructing you becomes obviously desired. If it requires you to bend the knee, don't. Stand up straight, literally and figuratively. Simple test, when preparing and when in court, notionally, appear for the other side. Your opinion and your evidence should be completely unchanged. I repeat, your duty is not primarily to your clients, but to the court. That's enough on nuts and bolts underpinned by principle and philosophy. Two different points before I leave you to the rest of this splendid conference. A well-deserved recognition of the status and importance and complexity of some types of expert evidence is shortly to find expression in the publication of the first in a series of judicial primers. The Patents Court has long had them. The outgone Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas, thought the system would profit by the creation of more of them for use by judge and counsel in areas of complex science. He secured collaboration between the Royal Society, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and the senior judiciary, and the first primer on DNA will be published on the 22nd of November. The second will be on GAIT analysis, that's G-A-I-T, uh, and then uh, on collision science, and we hope plenty more. The object is to allow the judge and counsel better to understand the basics and, if need be, then drill down to more detail. And I suggest that, without more, this excellent initiative brings us back to where I began. Given the developing scholarship across so many disciplines, we need And ultimately, something just for you to think about. AI, artificial intelligence, is entering into our lives. Uh, if we contemplate how you have to record and track input into your conclusions, who worked on the examination and at what level, etc., etc., will there be nervousness about how to set out the part played by AI? How is something by definition so vast 
to be amenable to testing, if at all. I have in mind Watson, which can, as I understand it, rattle through thousands of papers and, and give the experts information in minutes, which would otherwise take researchers an age. I am not for a moment suggesting that there should be anxiety. It's just that if let loose on a topic, I tend to think round the corners. It's one to chat about over a coffee break, perhaps. And finally, in any address such as this, the old rules are the best. Leave them laughing, preferably at the speaker. You've all seen it. Council tries to chip away at the power or the certainty of the opinion from the other side. You can't exclude, can you? That's not a view set in stone, is it? That conclusion must admit of a degree of uncertainty. Many similar phrases of erosive potential. The last resort, if one has made little or no progress, is the final question in cross-examination. It is most classically expressed when medics are the experts. Picture me in silk, not examining Professor X, a world-class paediatric pathologist, called by the Crown in the alleged murder of an infant. He was giving no quarter, having padded around, trying to take the odd brick out of his wall, then putting the alternative mechanism and getting absolutely nowhere, I resorted to the last question, to which there is always only one answer, and I knew what it was. But, Professor X, you would agree that you can't 100% exclude what I have put to you. I can't. I began to sink gracefully to my seat to hear him continue, but in this case, I get as near 100% as someone like me ever will. Game, set, championship. Um, it is very good of you, those of you who have been, <laughs> to have listened to me. It's a real privilege for someone like me to come to an event like this and to look at these literally hundreds of faces at the top of their professional tree. What I've done in this address is try to give you a combination of pretty practical approaches born of years of advocacy in excellent training hands, plus a little bit of principled thought planted for you to discuss amongst yourselves later on. I do very much hope the one thing you haven't felt is in any way patronised, and I very, very much hope that the one thing you have felt is lauded, appreciated, and understood. Thank you very much.